Self-care is not selfish. It's selfless. Yeah. Never let fear decide your future. Oh, never. And let go of all judgment. Hey, guys, if you missed out on the last conference in Nashville, Tennessee, you don't want to miss out on the next one. It's April 28th through May 3rd, Orlando, Florida, the Gaylord Palms Resort and Convention Center. You made a mistake missing the last one. You don't want that to happen again on this one. Five days of some of the best training you're ever going to experience packed into one event. We have an early bird special right now, $50 off. Use 24 early bird on our website, streetcop.com. Look for the conference, click the link, register today. If you want to get significantly better at this profession in five days, don't dare miss out on the 2024 Street Cop Conference. Hey everybody, Heather Gloglitch here, Street Cop Training Instructor for the Complete Female Cop. We are on the Street Cop Podcast, and I am actually your host today, and I am going to be interviewing the one and only Uncle Den, Dennis Benino, who is the CEO, owner of Street Cop Training. <laughs> the one and only. How did I do I, that? I guess the one and only is appropriate because there really is one and only, but we're making it sound like I'm somebody special. You are someone special. Well, it may be in an education kind of way. Or in a friendship kind of way. Th- okay. Those that are lucky to be in your inner circle are lucky. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. You're welcome. So I'm actually really excited to do this because I feel like I'm always on the other end of it. And you're the one who's always with the pen and scribbling. And I think I found in the past year, actually, it's almost exactly a year since I started with Street Cop. Crazy. Uh, I get all these questions about you and the business and being a part of Street Cop and what it's like. And it's still super surreal for me. So I, my first question is, how did Street Cop come to fruition? I get this question a lot. And I'm going to give you the very macro answer. Probably developed more of my frustration of watching everybody act and perform that was not necessary. So not necessary in the sense of you could have done this, but you chose to do that because of your lack of education. And I don't mean that in a sense where I'm sounding like I'm this end-all and be-all and know-all but I was getting educated and learning and I'm watching other people struggle with this job because they don't know and haven't been educated. So I think that irritated me enough where I said, okay, this is clearly an issue. It's a big issue. I think I can fix it. And the reason I thought I could fix it was when I was field training people, we were seeing a significantly better product come out of my police car than most people's police cars. As a matter of fact, I would get people so when our people graduated from field training program, they get put into a rotundo, essentially, uh, or a round robin of you're going to this squad for three months, then you're going to this squad for three months. Then you, we have five squads. So you go all these squads, you're going to rotate for two or three years. And I would purposely try to take the new guy or new girl when they came to my squad. I'd forfeit my partner because we were a double two-man units. And... I would want to take them when I had the opportunity to do so. And at that time, I had the clout to say to the bosses, put them in my car, right? Uh, or if my, guy, my partner was on vacation, give me this guy or this girl for the next two weeks because so-and-so is not going to be here so I can give them some advanced field training that they're already in the program. And I would watch people come into my car on the first day after completing field training and doing some of the craziest, most unsafe, had no clue, running radar, don't know what they're talking about. And I'm like, what are you doing? And they're like, bro, this is how I was trained. And I'm like, that's terrifying. Because your fucking friend you graduated the academy with, he just wrote two search warrants last week and he's nine months on the job. He's like, well, obviously something was different. Something was, dis- there was a disparity here in some sense. So I thought, okay, if I can do this for one person, I could probably do this, I could probably scale it up a little bit. And I just wanted to share what I knew because I thought I could help. So for people who aren't, Easy learners, right? So case law can be very confusing, especially if you don't take the time to read things and understand the shall, the must, the should. Well, shall, the must, and should is interesting because that is typically the language you can find in a, I don't think you find that language a lot in case law. Case law is literally just black and white. It's, it's cut and dry. And people try to interpret case law in their own twist because they don't understand it. And honestly, to understand, and I'll use the Fourth Amendment only, To understand Fourth Amendment case law, you would need to know a lot of Fourth Amendment case law to really understand what the courts meant and how it correlates with previous decisions. You can't just read one thing and and assume that you can apply this appropriately. So I think I know where you're going with this question. What my job is to do 
is to make you f- understand in a set of circumstances what the proper and permissible action would be. You don't need to know the name. You need to know that I said you could do this. I showed you where it said you could do this. Be comfortable in doing this. And if anybody ever questions it, here's your program. Go back and explain this to them. Yeah, I think my question also moved into for people who want to learn how to read case law better on their own. So when I attended your class years ago, it's where we first met. I loved everything you said, but I have always been one of those people where, yes, tell me what you think is right, but I want to go back and read it for myself to interpret it to see if I'm on the same page or or I'm interpreting right or where I need to maybe improve on how I'm reading through things. How do you maybe motivate people to do that on their own? It's like motivating people to go to the gym. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it is. If you want it bad enough and you want to be a professional versus you want to be less fat, more fit, same shit right? How do you get people to motivate? Like you can sell them something and they're going to put it in a fucking closet and hang clothes on it. It's no different than buying an ab, ab roller or an ab master or, or a, what's the gym that Chuck Norris used to do? I don't know, but Tybo came to my mind when you started talking yeah, about Yeah, Tybo. I mean, all these things are, <laughs> I mean, everything. So for the fitness industry, it's the same thing. I mean, these sensations come out. I just saw something the other day. You just watch these commercials, you know who they're selling to. And what the sale is, is very quickly, you can look like a supermodel for men and women. And everybody bites and buys into that. But the reality is that nobody actually completes the thing. So you can become a case law expert if you want to put the time in. It's not hard to do if you have somewhat of an intelligence level. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room. What I do like is there are books, and I always talk about uh, criminal justice for the law enforcement professional or criminal procedure for law enforcement professional, found at Blue 360 Media. That is, I have no skin in the game on that. I just like the book because it simplifies things and it's for, I don't want to say the amateur, but maybe the novice, but not the veteran. The veteran will take that, have curiosity and take bits and clips and pieces and then go read the entire opinion to understand what the mindset of the courts were and how it correlated to previous decisions. I've been reading it for 15 years, uh, 16 years now. So yeah, I have a lot of time in it. I mean, do it for professionally for a living. But I must continue to practice it to make sure that I can speak about, and there's, let me tell you something also, there's like, there's a ton of shit I don't know. But I recognize if I could learn and know really well, maybe just a, 100 to 200 cases, it actually answered 95% of the questions in law enforcement. And when they get outside of the realm of that 95% and they go to that 5%, I just rely and lean on Zach Miller or... Ken Rice or anybody else who's a law enforcement, who's a case law professional. So how do you learn it more? Just like going to the gym, get the book, start reading it, go into Google Scholar, start toying around with words, handcuffing, uh, canine spelled both ways. Oh, all of a sudden all these cases come up. You could literally right now in your state, go to scholar.google.com or get a free case text.com account for 14 days, select your state and run those and read those cases, which people are like, I don't know, it seems like it's a lot. Well, just read it and tell me what you think. Where did you get confused? Because then people start reading it like, why? Well, it was, actually wasn't confusing at all. Typically, the questions being posed to the court on a constitutionality basis are in the beginning and the answers are typically at the end. And the reasoning for the answers are found in the middle. So it essentially starts of here's the question, here's what happened. This is how we're going to answer it and why our our conclusion is at the end. And at the end, here's the conclusion. So, for example, can a police officer in the state of New Jersey, uh, Ponte and Baum come to um, my mind of, I think it's Baum. Can a police officer in New Jersey, when somebody refuses to give consent to search of their vehicle, threaten the use of a canine? And the answer is, and they'll say that in the beginning, like, here we're we're here today to discuss whether this is a permissible action under the Fourth Amendment, Article 1, Paragraph 7 of the New Jersey Constitution. Excuse me. So they also just fall in line with the Fourth Amendment. And it says, you know, so then they'll say, today we conclude that yes, as long as the threat is calmly given, not a deceptive threat to change somebody's informed consent, then, and it's not, it's not based around these things, as long as it's professionally done, and it's just a prediction of the events that are going to follow, it's certainly a permissible action. Here's what happened. Mr. Baum was stopped and a car stopped, da, da, da. He then told, Officer Johnson then told Baum, If you don't want to give us consent to search the car, that's fine, but we're going to call for a dog. I just want you to know what's going to happen next. Baum shows up and says, that was 
coercion. And the court said, it wasn't coercion. That's exactly what happened. So the court says, it wasn't coercion. The way he did it, we watched the video. It sounded calm. It sounded polite. That's not coercion. He, he was not under obligation, but it was certainly a courtesy by the police officer to let you know what was going to happen next if you refused consent to search. And at the end, that's the conclusion. Yeah, so here's why. This is what we want you to follow that same procedure. And if you do it in a calm, professional, polite manner, why not being a dick is so important as a cop? We'll rule with you. We'll say that that wasn't coercion. And that's a defense that the defense will no longer have to use because there's case law. Now, precedent says cops can tell somebody that a dog is en route when they refuse consent to search. And if that person changes their mind and then gives consent, that doesn't taint the consent. So when you're out there and you do that because you've read this piece of case law, but then you come back and you're criticized by a supervisor, coworker, or prosecutor, who says, you can't do that. And you go, no, no, I actually can. And that's the rub of when you're starting a company and saying, nobody is following the rules. You guys are all just making stuff up uh, off the top of your head on how you feel. But the rules are clear. It's like playing football. There are rules to the game of football. You just don't get to go onto the football field and play soccer and say, no, that's how we do it, though. We play soccer. That's not how the game's played, though. Nobody's, nobody's, you can't play it that way. It's not football anymore. It's now just some other game. But that's how we do it. Yeah, I understand that's how you do it, but it doesn't make any sense. You're not playing football. You're playing soccer. So when you say that to people who for many, many years all thought they knew what they were doing, and especially when a lot of egos hung up on titles and certificates and claims of insignias, it, it's very frustrating for people to be exposed or to at least have the revelation when you have no humility that we don't know what we're doing. I'm not trying to fight with those people. I want those people to just get better. Right? Just hear me out. And I think there's confusion with my bravado and how I present in my New Jersey. No bullshit. You know, it's cut and dry. It's simple. There's no conversation to have. There's no argument to be had. Here's the answers. You must follow them. So. Yeah. Did I answer the question? How you, you did. You did. Well, yeah. We segued into, and you actually segue into my next portion really well. But what I want to comment on is, I don't think people really understand that you are not, I mean, they know that you're not a cop anymore and that you're tired, but I think they also don't understand that the way that you present keeps people engaged. And a lot of people, not, I shouldn't even say a lot of people, but there are people that take offense to the way that you present and really it's not their right to, right? They think that there should be this level of quote unquote, their defined professionalism and you're a private entity. Right. So it's just the way you present, like I have been to your class numerous times. I learn something every single time I go. You can't learn everything you're teaching when you see you, your class once, but everybody should continue to go. And case law gets updated every day. Right. Well, so, I want to back up on that a little bit. It yeah. actually doesn't. So if you have historic and I'm not trying to, I, that's a big myth about case law. Yeah. Is typically as long as you've spent the time to get a good understanding of case law, you know, you spend, if you spend 10 hours and if you go to our website, streetcop.com, there's a resources section. You can read case law. I think if you read those 60 cases that I've selected, you're eons ahead of everybody else in the field, and that stuff rarely changes. We see new case law when pretty much technology has been a big thing about that lately. Um, obviously, when there's confusion and the courts need to clarify the and give a constitutional interpretation of something but overall stuff really doesn't change you can rely upon case law from i mean the automobile exception came to fruition in 1925 they've had about i don't know 20 plus interpretations at the u.s supreme court to give more clarity on the automobile exception but it's never been rechallenged or hasn't changed states can decide to part ways with the u.s supreme court and their decision and remove the automobile exception ability from their police officers, which five or six actually do, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, um, Oregon, I think is one of them, Washington State. But it doesn't change daily. I will also give you credit because I don't want to say that maybe I misinterpreted a little bit. I think you need to practice it every day. I don't yeah. think you need to worry about what's changed that much. I think you need to constantly read it to stay fresh on it. Yeah. I just, I, I think there's this misconception about, uh, You've seen your class once and you don't need to see it again. And I just, like I said, I've learned so much every time I go. Uh, but you have now been retired for how long? What's the date? June 15th. In two days, it'll be eight years. Okay. Eight years. Yeah. You've been retired. What would, in eight years, I have seen so much growth from you as a person and as a leader. 
What would you, Dennis Benino of today, tell Dennis Benino, the cop of maybe even 10 or 15 years ago? I think that we do a good job of putting our arms around people and giving them guidance because I think we're essentially putting arms around ourselves. And this is constant. So there's a lot of things I would tell that guy. And I think I constantly tell that guy those things publicly. And there's probably a hundred things I would tell that person that nobody ever told me. And that's why we have the existing training. So to answer that would probably take 10 minutes, but maybe I'll pick three things that I would tell that person from that time period. Uh, Number one, mind your own business. That's a big one. And number two, don't let the opinions of others dictate where you're going in your life. And number three, this is just from a, a police officer's perspective. I'm not talking about life in general because I give you a lot of those too, compassion, non-judgment, all that stuff. Because that's I had to learn a lot of that stuff too. I was never taught it. Uh, number three, don't wait to be picked because life is very short. And if you're waiting to be picked, it could be over and you were never chosen to play on the team. So... And I'm going to throw four in because I said it yesterday on a different podcast. Don't let anxiety dictate your decisions. It breaks my heart when I watch a lot of people who feel like they're stuck and they're not because they're, they're in their own brain, letting their amygdala make decisions for them when they should follow what they know to be the truth. And the truth is scary sometimes. So constantly what comes to my mind is I don't think as a police officer, you should be treated by your administration like a piece of shit. Agreed. So if you're treated like a piece of shit, You could uh, give two options. You could continue to get treated like a piece of shit, or you can go somewhere else where they don't treat you like a piece of shit. Why people stay in that is probably the same reason why people stay in bad relationships, Uh, why people don't look to change. And I think that, uh, I think it has to do with a lot of fight or flight. And I think it has to do with like the, the, just that constant, you're letting anxiety dictate your life. And it's a huge mistake. As a matter of fact, anxiety dictates my life in just the opposite direction. So I look for the fear and that's where I follow it. I know that the best stuff is on the other side of the fear. But it takes a lot of balls initially. Dude, now it's like fear is a joke to me. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I still get anxiety, right? Like we have this bullshit going on. And every time some attorney's calling me, I'm like, like, but that lasts now for 10 minutes where before it would last for fucking three days. Because I just understand what it means now. It means it's temporary and I'm having concerns about things that never even happened yet. Um, And this too shall pass is super important. Yeah. I love that. I get a lot of questions and I'm so glad you actually brought that up. That segues perfectly because I get questions all the time and I know you do too. And we get them as all the instructors. How do I give up one thing to go somewhere else? How do I know that it's going to be the right decision that I'm making? And that can go in any part of our lives, right? You talked about relationships, but How will you never know? You'll never know. Right. Right. People get stuck in that comfortability, even if it's not something they're comfortable with, right? If they're in a bad relationship, if they are you know, at an agency where they're like, well, I'm comfortable here and I have a little bit of seniority and I'm at this pay raise and I might have to go back. And they know that the opportunity waiting for them is a really great opportunity. And they're scared to take that step forward because they're not sure how it's going to work out. Uh, So I love that you said that. So advice for somebody who wants to leave and is nervous, maybe they have a really good group of people that they work with, but their administration is just not about the kind of cop that they want to be, or uh, they are stuck somewhere and they know they're never going to get promoted and they might have to take a pay cut. Like, what would your advice be to those people? What are you so afraid of? Some sort of pretty good. Failing is pretty much, I think, the answer I get all I'm the afraid time. every fucking day. Yeah. So how do you control that? What are you afraid of? And is it real? Yeah. And I'll, I'll throw in some additional advice there. And the, these are the same things I try to understand. Like, you know, I, I'm also very big into real personal relationships. Dating, namely, I think I really have that nailed down, as weird as that sounds, and it hurts a lot of people's feelings. It's so funny that people come right to me back for advice once their relationships that I predicted would fail have failed. I have met people even recently who, where was I, um, who were complaining about their girlfriend. Oh, we were in uh, a police week. I met a cop from, who knew uh, a girl that came down that we knew, and he, like, hates his girlfriend. And I said to him, why is she your girlfriend then? Well, she, you know, I need a little help with the dogs. I'm like, why don't you just get a dog walker? 
and be happy. Spend the 50 bucks. You got 50 bucks a month? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. I'm like, so why don't you just get somebody to let the dogs out the one time you're at work and be happy? I'm trying to understand, I'm not professional enough, why do people stay in relationships like that? Why? And the detriment of that is, while you're sitting, wasting time as time goes by, guys, you have to remember, time is very precious. You are missing so many other opportunities. So while you're tied up in this relationship that you're miserable in, you probably missed, maybe on a few occasions, you're lucky if it's only one, the person that you would have been happy with the rest of your life. Yeah. You were stuck in this. And obviously there's psychological reasons behind that, but you can, you can start to get a real grasp on understanding you and then taking a step outside of your brain and looking at the circumstances. So we had some rules. We can take this and translate it to a police department. But this is, and I'll, I'll do both. If you were, if God came down to you and said, describe the perfect wife or husband, what do they look like? Well, they'd be funny and everybody would like them and they'd be pretty and they would be health conscious and they would be non-judgmental and they would be work, they like want to work and have like good, because those things I look for, not everybody's going to look for that. Like some people want a person who's going to drink beers with them, right? Like, you know, that's the truth. Like, that's why we outgrow each other sometimes in relationships. Um, but if that was the person you wanted, okay, now we know where the bar's set. So as you go out and you meet people, does this person check most of those boxes? And if they don't check all of them, which ones didn't they check and is that acceptable? So it's like, hey, if you had to describe a police department that you wanted to work for, tell me what it looks like. Oh man, we'd have tack vests and um, like they would have a, a good pursuit policy and our administration would care about us and uh, you'd have a decent contract. Now you can't have it all. You got to get to about 90% where you're going to be and that's a really good win. But you can't settle for 40%. So yeah, get the outer vest carriers and you like the uniforms, but you get, guys get talked to like your pieces of shit. They're ripping internals like that's going out of style. They're trying to suspend people for, for farting. I just heard a story. Somebody got, was, almost got suspended and got transferred off for farting and making a joke about it and like literally was transferred to another division. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so my point is, is like nothing surprises me anymore. It just frustrates me now more. Yeah. Um, you know, why are you allowing yourself to be sold so short and what's causing that? What are you so scared of? Got to know how to control the fear, man. That's it. Once you learn how to control fear and identify excuses, that was the biggest, I think that's probably one of the biggest paradigm shifts in my life is when I began to, or I got trained to learn how to recognize excuses. And once that happens, <laughs> your, your uh, circle of friends is going to minimize tremendously because oh, yeah. excuses for me are very frustrating. My kids don't get permission to make excuses. The other day, like, well, my friends are playing Fortnite, and I'm like, you have obligations to go to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. All your friends there expect you to show up and be their partner to fight with them. So that's how it's going to go, brother. Turn the fucking thing off. That's how it's going to, like, we're, we're going. Like, you know, your father's going to kidnap you to, to BJJ. You're going to thank me later on. But, and they love it. I'm not sitting there and they're miserable yeah. the whole time. It's just that initial, like, oh, I have to go to work. Right. Right. Why don't I want to? You know, let's, let's find out what, what's your excuse. Oh, I actually don't waste a lot of time, energy, and effort now on people that I think are not going to listen to me. So if you want to come to me and say, hey, how do I start a business? I give you three books. There's no other conversation. Here's your three books. When you're done reading them, call me. 99% of people will never call me. I'm, but I'm spending two, three hours explaining things to people about business and life. If you're that motivated, here's your three books. I, you know, just keep like moving right into my next question, which is great. So my next question was going to be, you are a giver. I don't think a lot of people, I, I actually do think a lot of people know that. And the people that get to really get to know you understand that you are very much someone that would give everything to anybody who needed it because you're just that person. And I love, secretly, it's very selfish of me because I get such a high from it. I get That's that. That's my favorite thing to do. And I don't even want the rewards for it. It's the inter like I don't want the accolades for being that. It's the inter the way it makes me feel internally to be a good human being. Yeah. Which I'm fuck. It's like my cocaine. Yeah. Like when everything happened with my ex husband when he killed himself in December, and I brought my kids the very next day. Like they came in and they were they were pretty broken. And they walk in and you were just like, here, take some crumble cookies and do this and do. You I gave you a dozen crumble cookies. You yeah. did, and and then you also like brought them into the merch room. And some people will look at that and be like, you can't just buy people. To and make them feel better, but that's not what it's about with you. You're just this person that is like, 
let me give what I can. And this is what I can do right now. It made a huge difference. I mean, they, they left her smiling the day after their father died, right? It was, you're impactful in ways I'm not really sure that you know. I try to tell you as much as I can because I feel like a lot of people are coming at you. But how do you balance being the person that wants to be a giver, being the person that wants to be there for people and giving them your time because you know that people are worthy of it and then also giving yourself the time that you need in order to balance that out? I'm always putting myself first. I love that you said that. And some people will listen to that right now and they're going to be like, he's so selfish, blah, 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 blah. But really, self-care is not selfish. Right. Because if your cup is empty. We had a conversation the other day. I forgot who it was. It was a podcast episode and somebody said, well, oh, it might have been last night. My kids are always my top priority. I said, sometimes my business is my top priority because my kids are my top priority. Yeah. Right? So like if they want to go to Disney and that's a top priority for an experience for them, that means I have to choose the business over them sometimes because... I don't get to just do everything. So it's interesting. I know that in order to be the best I can for everybody, I have to be the best I can for me to start. And I have to do self-care, like my nutrition, my meditation habits, my exercise. And you may not get more of me, but you get better of me. And I'd rather you have a better version of me. Like, dude, I came back from Mykonos. I was jet lagged. Oh, I was like, this is crazy. Do people feel like this regularly? Like I was in bad. Like I came back and, and people were like, you look miserable. I'm like, well, because I am. That's because I was so jet lagged. And actually, I've never been that jet lagged in my life. I was seven hours ahead over there. But I knew that I just had to get myself correct again so I could now serve everybody else correctly. So yeah, I'm, uh, and I hate to take this. It's not my phrase. It's Gary Vee's phrase is I am selfish to be selfless. So everything that I do may look like it starts with me, but it ends with everybody else. Yeah, and I think that's a really important lesson for everybody, even the newest cop, right? Because they come in and they want to give, 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 and they're so worried about how they're going to appear if they take a sick day or how they're going to appear if they go on that vacation or they say no to doing whatever because they're trying to fit in. They're trying to be a part of that thin blue line, and really they're just letting go of themselves. And it's just a a really negative effect that continues until you wake up and you're like, they, they can replace me tomorrow. And anybody can, mm-hmm. right? In any role of your life. That's awesome. That's really, really good. Uh, all right. Well, you talked about business. What are the three books that you would recommend for somebody who wanted to start their own business? I think that one, you need to begin to change perspective about life and understand what your potential is. My best friend, who is my best, best, best friend of all time. And I was talking about my friend, I don't want to say his name, but he just had an exit on one of his companies for 12.2 million. And I said, Brian, he's no different than us. You know what I mean? He just has different perspectives. These people are no different than you and I are. They just have different perspectives, probably not different upbringings, but found different sources of education that got them to think differently. So your first step to trying to self-improve, and there should be no shame about wanting more in life and wanting to have more tangible items and a more exciting and enjoyable life. It's fantastic. It's so much better being less poor than I once was. Um, different problems come with it, uh, and it is very frustrating and, and scary at times, but it is well worth it. But I think the first thing you have to do is make a decision on who you're going to be from this point forward. And then there are so many resources out there, and there are probably books that I won't name that probably should be named because I haven't come across them yet. I like the idea of people Googling top 50 business books. And I think you, you rolled through those. And you could do that on your way to work. Everything's on an audio book now. It's all I do is audio learning because I'm very, very impatient. Then I constantly have to move. Me and Jay could not, not sit on the beach in Mykonos. It was crazy. Like I could not sit there for more than like 15 minutes. It's brutal. I have to move. I could we be walk there the all beach day. Up and down. I can't. Can't do it. Once I'm like, you want to get a drink? She's like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> you want to get lunch? Let's like, you want to go over there? Like, let's go look at that. You want to go on jet ski? Could not sit still. And we were laughing because we're like, we're ridiculous. We can't sit still. Like, let's take pictures. Let's FaceTime people. Like, we just could not sit. But that's the norm of my brain. But books, I think the first thing people need to do, if we're talking about business and not about life, which I think both of them coincide with one another, I think books by Robert Kiyosaki, The Basic Understandings of How Money Works, um, so Robert Kiyosaki wrote books called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I think that first book, What the Rich Teach Their Kids About Money, and probably the second book, which is The Cash Flow Quadrant, are probably two of the most important books people should, I think everybody should read them just so you understand money. People don't understand money. They have no idea what they're doing. 
People don't understand 401ks and what they're designed to do. 401ks are designed to do one thing. Defer taxes until you go into a lower bracket. So when you're retired and you re to plan, everybody's planning to retire poor. That's the whole game. Think about your pension. You're going to take 65% or 50% or whatever it may be of your pension and live off of that. Why are we not trying to stack away 200% of what we made before and then live like a king for the re re remainder of our retirement? Things that people don't think about. So when you have start having those shifts in how we think about money and how we think about life, it's very uncommon. Those who have not planned that way or ever thought that way or find themselves in the situation already retired find it very offensive, but it's all true. Uh, and I think the second part of it is like finding books where you can learn about what your true potential is, how to behave better as a human being, and recognizing things like excuses. So I think there's some real thoughtful, sentimental books, some very hard books, anything Grant Cardone related. I always have to give credit where credit's due. The guy changed my life. A lot of people don't like him. Uh, and I think that he comes across in a similar way that I do, where it can be abrasive. But the first book I read, which is a kind of cliche Ricky Bobby thing, was If You're Not First, You're Last by Grant Cardone. I think about minute 47. I've got to go back into that book because I want to reminisce of where I was 10 years ago. But I think about minute 47 into it, I knew my life would be different because for the first time, somebody said things to me that nobody ever said before. And that's all I had to hear. So I think, you know, like, mother of my children, she has been like, who said that, Grant Cardone? Who said that, Gary Vaynerchuk? And I'm like, but when people say things, it's like you pick up on things and you really, it really resonates with you and touches your soul and you know it's really true. Why not repeat it? You know, why not repeat those things? Hey, everybody. I'm Heather Glogolich, instructor here for Street Cop Training for the course, The Complete Female Cop. This class is not just for females. It's not just about gender specific issues. It was really formed in order to allow people to find that passion again for policing, to understand that their self identity doesn't need to be changed just because they want to fit the mold and to really help bring about change, change in the profession, not just for women, but for everybody to be heart led servant leaders. If you're interested in taking the course, you can visit streetcop.com and search Heather Glogolich and you'll be able to find it. I'm also really excited to announce that I have a new course coming out. It's gonna be called Be The Change. Some of the great feedback I got from this year's conference in Nashville was that the men in this profession didn't feel like they wanted to take a spot away from the women that they work with for my first course that I teach. And so I was really able to sit down and put it together a course about culture change and building effective teams and learning about a growth mindset versus stagnation mindset pushing forward and just being the best cop that you can be both personally and professionally. So really excited for that to be coming out soon. Keep an eye out for it. Thank you all so much. Stay safe and be the change. Have you read the book On Fire by John O'Leary? I haven't. It's fantastic. It's, uh, it, it's how to live an ignited life. So short story, when he was younger, he basically lit himself on fire and almost his entire body was burned. Wow. And because his younger sister- Why did he do it purposely or by accident? So he saw his older brothers playing with fire. He wanted to. They said, no, you're too young. So the next day he went into the garage by himself, tried to do it, use lighter fluid and his whole body wow. on fire. Then he caught his house on fire. Wow. And if his little sister had not run back into the burning house and got water and threw it on his face because he was hysterical, he would have had no skin to graft. Wow. And he wrote this book and it's about the seven lessons on how to live a fully ignited life. And one of my favorite ones is the growth versus stagnation. I kind of, I really believe that you would love that book. I read it in a day. It's so good. I don't know if you do auto audiobooks. I can't do that. I'm too oh, much. I, do. I can't, I'm too scatterbrained. My, I have to read the words nope. on the page, but I have it's to. It's phenomenal. Yeah, it's I have really to do audiobooks. Good. On Fire, John O'Leary. Fantastic. I have recently read, I'm a little bit, this has nothing to do with the book you recommended because I'm going to just buy it. Um, my advice to people is when they read books, don't get so bored, give them a chance. And if you're 90% away through the book and nothing has spoken to you, uh, for the first time ever, I comfortably walked away from two books and they are significant books, but I've already been there. And yeah. I don't need to return because that's the way I live my life already. However, 10 years ago, those books would have been a great gift. And, you know, it's, it's, it sounds so cliche and maybe in some sense so dorky, but I am so happy with who I am right now and I'm so eager for the future. And I've, a million problems like everybody else, but I feel like I have unlocked some significant life secrets and I'm experiencing a life now that I'm just comfortable knowing that as I continue on this path, when I'm an old man laying in bed, I just want to make sure I say to people, I have no regrets, I'm ready. 
I did everything I could do. I just was, this was a blast. I have no, so far, because I have peace with the past, and I don't play hindsight 2020, I, I don't have, I really have enjoyed my life. Like, think about it. Like, it's just fucking nuts. The things that we've been doing, and, and why don't other people do this, or why have people not found this? Mm, fear. Think about if Eminem was scared to ever rap. Yeah. That's really and great. never opened his mouth. You would never know who Eminem is. The crazy thing is, there's probably 50 Eminems in this country who, are, who let fear and anxiety dictate. And that fear comes from like the fear of judgment of others and things like that. But imagine if he didn't rap. The world would never know the greatest rapper of all time. That's not me saying that. That's every other rapper in the game. There's a famous clip of 50 Cent saying, uh, you know, nobody wants to admit this. And hip hop is a black thing. And the best guy in the game is a white dude. Yeah, I've seen that clip. Right? So it's a, fa it's a famous clip. It's not me saying that. But what if you'd never opened his mouth? What if Beyonce decided never to sing? Yeah. You know, um, what if these people never decided never to act? So I think that's what separates um, those who have, you know, really fruitful lives and those who live in a cocoon. I think you have to find gratitude in the bad moments, too. That's a hard thing to do. It is, but you said it. You're really happy with who you are right now. And I feel the same way. And we both have not had very easy lives. There's a lot. And people probably look at us and they see our Instagrams or they see everything that we are succeeding at. And they don't realize all the failures that we had along the way. Well, I don't really. Nobody takes out their phone and turns on Instagram live when they're having uh, a dispute with their spouse or um, there are medical issues in your life. Um, or, you know, nobody highlights that stuff because, one, it's not fair to the other person, but, you know, I mean, I can't emphasize it enough. There are still things about me that I'm continuing to, I mean, I learn every day. I make a decision sometimes on food, and I'm like, I shouldn't have got that. I won't get it next time, right? But I wouldn't know if I didn't try to order it. But I'm like, oh, I know I should have done that. Next time I'll get something different. How do you know if you don't try? So true. So for a long time, I tried to be a part of this company and it was really because of what appeared to be the culture that you had created. I think culture is a really significant thing for me right now. I love the idea of culture, changing culture, creating a positive culture, especially within law enforcement because it's so negative. And once I got here, it was apparent that everything that I thought was true was. And people will ask me all the time, how do I get to be a part of Street Cop? Because they want to be a part of this. They are a part of it. They are. I mean, like this inner circle team where you come in and there's just, there's love. Like there's legitimate love. Like yeah. you walk into this building and regardless of who you are, you are welcomed and you oh, are yeah. just immediately a part of the team. What are the things that you knew you had to implement when you started actually running a company with people that you took under your care to make sure that they could provide for their families and, and to build the business? What are the, the leadership qualities you knew you needed to bring to the table in order to create the culture that you've created? I think on the grand scales that I love them. So when I perform, it, I'm performing with love. Um, and I think that you need to learn what the perspective of the person who you are trying to help is seeing. So if they're having difficulty, it doesn't mean they're not trying. They just might need a little guidance. If they're doing something they shouldn't be doing, it wasn't because they were fucking off and doing something that they shouldn't be doing in the sense of, let me just give a little bit more of an example of that. If somebody wasn't given direction and starts to do something they thought they should be doing, you can't get frustrated because they weren't fucking off and doing nothing or trying to take money from you. They just need to be redirected. Like, okay, cool, man. I appreciate that. We're just going to pause that for a second. Let's do this other thing in the, uh, in the interim. Or we don't need to do that anymore. It's not going to work. And here's why we've done it three times in the past. But I understand where it came from of why I did that. And, and ensuring that they know and they're comfortable with the fact that their boss is not a chump. He's not afraid to address issues and to get rid of people who come in here and disturb this place. And we'll hear a lot of our employees say like, I love this place. I love everybody here, like my family. And I say to them, I had to get rid of a lot of fuckheads because I can't undo 15 years or 20 years of a dog being beaten in a junkyard and then take that dog and try to bring them into a playful puppy land because that dog will bite everybody. And I'm going to tell everybody this 
one, just one person can disrupt the whole thing. One person, literally one, not two, not three, and you separate them. One bad apple in business will ruin the bunch. Like it will, the cancer will spread. And when you notice it, it's got to go immediately. You can try to put energy and effort and redirect it. But once you realize there's nothing you can do to help this person, they have to leave. They just have to leave. There's nothing you can do um, because it's disrupting everybody so much. And that indecision in business to remove that person has such a ripple effect. The longer you keep them, when you know it's not right because you're scared to have that tough conversation or scared to pull the trigger because you feel bad that they, they can't work here anymore, the repercussions of that indecision, they're dire, man. I mean, we are still paying today for, and I'm talking, not talking like a couple hundred, I'm talking hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars because we were afraid to make a decision then or we didn't do this or we didn't address those situations. So. I think everybody here knows that obviously there is interest in procuring revenue because that's what the lifeblood of a company is. But I think everybody here has no fear when they come in. There's no fear. There can't be fear in a workplace. There's no fear. And I can trust that I don't need to instill fear for them to get the job done. Because if you, I'm never going to rule with fear. But if you can't work under a rule without fear, you can't work here. I'm not going to disrupt the comfortability everybody has here because one person can't function without somebody who's breathing down their neck all the time. They just can't work here. So nobody wakes up in the morning and comes here scared about how I'm going to behave. There's no question about how I'm going to behave. Yeah. It's appropriate every single day without emotion. And I think everybody here feels that they have a purpose no matter what they do. And when they're here, they don't have somebody saying, oh, you're not getting your work done. And they're just getting their work done because they want to be a part of this team and they want to see it be as successful as possible. They really love too. being here. Yeah. I think they're self-driven people too. Yeah. You have so, the right crew. It took a lot to get to this. I've, right? seen a, I've seen a couple transitions. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like it, it, take, it takes a lot. Nobody has a manual on how to do this unless you have time in the field like, a, like you're a general and this is your third tour guiding the troops along. So you, you learn as you go. and. You know, sometimes people make mistakes. I'm like, oh, fuck, I fucked up. And I'm like, so what? I fuck up all the time. So do I get to yell at you when you fuck up? But when I fuck up, you don't get to yell at me? We don't play that game here. Yeah. There are very few times, I, don't even, I can't even recall any, that I've even had to have a sit down with anybody who's here at our core staff now. You know, other than the fact that sometimes I have to stay very adamant to a decision where they might not understand it. And I'll just say, look, I'm always receptive, but this one I know for sure. And if I'm wrong, so be it. And, you know, often people will be like, all right, well, if you're calling it and you're so strong about this, it's probably right, even though that makes sense to us. I just know that to be the truth. So that's the only time I ever pull like the monarch card yeah. where I'm like, we're not doing that. Like, okay. So recently we ordered a set of shirts and I was like, I didn't know these weren't the color, da, 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 the color. And they're like, I'm like, how many do we order? And they're like, a lot. And I'm like, dump them. And they're like, well, we don't know if it's going to work or not. I'm like, I'm telling you, my intuition tells me these are not going to be good. I just don't think they're going to sell. People aren't going to like them. And they're like, yeah, but I don't think it's a big deal. Eventually, so I'm like, guys, listen. Oh, we called the guy. It's a 10% restocking fee. It's $10,000. It's 1200 bucks to restock them if you want to get rid of the thing. I'm like, dump them. I'm telling you, dump them. Eat the fucking 1200 and we'll fly, as long as we can save the 10, 12,000 on the other back end, eat the 1,200. I don't give a fuck. We fucked up when we, when we did. I'm looking at it now. It's not going to work. Then the guy, the distributor is like, oh, he's like, you know, I don't know. I'm like, dude, we, none of us can predict what's going to happen. But I'm telling you, my gut from this experience says this one's not going to be a good one. And I was right. And everybody was pushing back on that. No, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. I'm like, I'm telling you, cancel it. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. We can always order more. But I'm telling you, cancel this shit. And thank God I did, because it would have been a ten, twelve thousand dollar mistake. So if I had allowed them to make to, I allow hundred dollar, a couple hundred dollar lessons if they want to try it themselves. I can't allow a twelve thousand dollar lesson when I know for a, f I was so strong in my adamant belief that this was not going to work that I had to pull the mono card and say, "Sorry, I'm ruling against everybody here. This one I have to stand firm on." But outside of that, I think everybody here knows how much I love them. I do too. And 
you know, what's really unique about this company, and I, I guess maybe it's unique to us in law enforcement because we're usually just in that one closed circuit of our individual agencies, but being able to be a part of the instructor team here and getting to know so many people just in our group chat that we have or on our Zoom calls and then getting to meet them at the conference, you have just surrounded yourself with some of the best of the best. I think human beings. Human beings is exactly what I was about to say, yeah. which in turn has made them some of the best of the best cops, which helps them be some of the best instructors, right? Yeah. I, it all starts it makes with who it they easy. are. For a business <laughs> with, with like instructors or like essentially contractors, right? From a barbers or tattoo artists or waiters or waitresses. These are people that have to work within the business to drive the business. So they're the, they're the machine of the business. What I've been in other businesses, what makes this easy in some sense is the fact that not only are your regular cops great people for the most part, now you get the best of the best, which are the best people because they deploy and have the most humility. They understand who you've been and they're also very hardworking. If you're the best cop at whatever it may be, it's because you're very driven. So it makes it very easy for me to work with people like that because of all those qualities. That's the one thing about this industry that's, fan for me at least in this business, that's fantastic, is that when we have, like our core group of people are great. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, like it's fucking nuts, right? It's really, like I am such a better human in the past, and I work really hard to be the best person I can be, but in the past year, just getting to know the instructors that are on the team here at Street Cop are just, it's, I feel blessed. I mean, I wake up every day and I'm, I'm like, how? Like Nick German, right? Yeah. Like you don't even really get a chance to talk to him often. And he's like quirky and super smart, but like kind of more meek and quiet, especially in comparison to some of the other instructors. <laughs> and when I get an opportunity to sit and talk to him, I'm like, I can't believe I have this wealth of knowledge. And he's a good human, right? You get on the They're phone. all good humans. Sean Barnett, like I had yeah, never no, met no, him. Yeah, nobody's better than him. Oh my gosh. I love that man with every, like, ugh. These I, guys don't have a bad bone in their body. None, not one. I can't think of one person who's got a bad bone in their body. I think maybe sometimes they let their anxiety dictate some actions, which is fine. It's understandable. But I think at the core, everybody's fantastic. And uh, I'm, a very, I'm a very fortunate man on we're, many levels. We're very fortunate to be a part of it. I hope you know that we all, we all think that. Yeah, I, I, I also want to say that I think I missed one piece about, I, I, I lead by example. And I won't tolerate things that, like I won't tolerate people making other people feel uncomfortable here. And nobody does. And everybody comes here knowing it's just, I hate to say this, but like almost a safe space. Yeah. Where they don't have to worry about, we've had it in the past, but their coworkers make them feel bad. Or their coworker having a bad day, and then they push it off on other people, make people uncomfortable. So it's rewarding to know that the people that work here tell me that they get excited for Monday. Yeah. And you know what's crazy? They're working all weekend. No. Caitlin works on vacation. I know. I get emails from Caitlin on a Sunday She's night. Like I'm like, what George. are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> like, this could have waited till tomorrow. But they care about all of you so much. They do. But they're great humans. They like, they're great human beings. So it's just natural for them to be uh, this way. Just like, and I have no problem at, asking people who are other great human beings for help. Uh, my next door neighbor's a great human being. I've been dumping a ton of chlorine into my pool. I'm like, hey, you're like the pool Nazi. Can you come over here and like check on my salt levels and stuff? Like, I can just dip the thing in and go down to fucking the pool store and let them test it and whatever it may be. But like, because I recognize that they're good human beings, I know it's no sweat off of my neighbor Paul's back to just come over for 10 minutes and, and, and bring his salt meter over. And uh, he's a good dude, man. Like, I, so I, and he knows that he can ask me for anything. I don't even like when people are good and you know they're good, you feel so comfortable with asks. I have more party equipment. Because the parties that I throw at my house, not that I'm throwing like the easy e wet party, right? <laughs> like it's not like it's, I have kids, like we have, but like uh, I, I'm I'm so happy when people say to me, like my our friend Jenna uh, just reached out, not Jenna in the office, another Jenna we know, uh, two days ago, and she's like, "Hey, we're having people over." I'm like, "I got six tents, thirty two chairs, eight tables. I had anything you we have, you want? You need cornhole? We got cornhole boards. I have five giant coolers." Uh, you need, I've, dude, I have industrial fans. I got five industrial fans for parties in my backyard. Yeah. Because and really like, nice heaters, too. Really nice heaters, right? Like, yeah. I have, we have all that stuff. So I'm delighted. And she's like, well, I'll send Sam over. I'm like, 
I already delivered them. They're in your fucking driveway already. She's like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. Like, I'm honored to be able to help you. Uh, so it's a very easy, when people ask me, it should be very easy for them to get, receive help and vice versa. And that's why I think that once you start surrounding yourself with people who really get it, it's very hard to have friends outside of it. And the, probably the last people you retain who aren't great are your family until you can't tolerate your family anymore. Yeah, I'm lucky to have a family that's kind of grown with me. We had, we, we had had our issues on certain levels. And when you start to promote that self-growth and you start to see the positivity versus the negativity and you choose gratitude over complaining, you, you do. You lose a lot of people in your circle, especially in law enforcement, because we, are, we can be very negative people. So I love that. All right. I think people in general are negative people. And I think that we're just yeah. so, as cops, we have such deep relationships with the people that we work with. You know, you're in a muster room together. What other job do you sit in a muster room for 15, 20 minutes before you go on the road? You know, what other job where you're all going to meet and have lunch together? So this, you're spending a lot of time with people. And so you're going to be absorbing that. And if they're not seeing things the way you're seeing things, there's going to be a lot of rubbing the wrong way. And I think people like us are more reserved about it, where now I just choose to disengage rather than argue. I will not surround myself with people who don't, see things the way that I see things, not because I disagree with it or I think they're assholes. I just don't choose to surround myself with people like that. I mean, I have friends of mine that aren't successful or uh, in their mind, financially, who are some of my biggest cheerleaders, Yeah, you know, who who just get it and they understand what I'm doing and and, uh, are admire it. But I admire them for many things. You can be talking about my best friend who's lieutenant to Port Authority. Um, He's my best friend. I don't know if you could meet another human being that you could trust more than Ryan Ust. I, I mean, anytime you bring him up to anybody who works or knows him, it's like you're talking about the Lord. Not necessarily, just because he's, he's a funny guy and he's such a good human being and he's got a good sense of humor and, and he, people don't realize about Ryan because he's very reserved on the surface. The raunchier the joke, the more you can get, like the more outlandish and re- offensive humor is, the more he makes him laugh. So you can take this guy in the service who's this professional lieutenant, and behind the scenes, I can say some of the craziest stuff, and he is like in tears. Uh, you know, you can just imagine. I mean, I really go hard with him because yeah. he's my best friend. So, um, but here's a guy who uh, is successful. It was a, I'm one of the youngest promoted lieutenants probably in the history of the agency, and in so many things. But he also is not like going to mastermind groups with people making thirty, fifty, a hundred million dollars a year. But he understands why I'm going to those things. And we discussed it. So we talked about last night. He was, he's like, yeah, it makes total sense. Like, I fucking love it. It's so good. Da, da, da. And I'm like, you know, we're best friends for, even his brothers said to me, like, we're his brothers. You're just, you and him have something very, very different and very, very special. And, um, and I love the guy for the human that he is. Not for the human he is for me, just the human that he is. He's one of those people that you need to thank the Lord when you have a friend like that because you don't get many of them in your life. Yeah. My, my friend is Carolina. She's, she's that person for me. Uh, and you know, we were talking about change and I can't specifically tell what I'm talking about, but you know that I'm about to make a very significant change, which in New Jersey people don't really do. Mm -hmm. And you talk about the people that we surround ourselves. And for the first time for the past year, not just being here, but at work, I just, I've not created, but I've been able to have this family of guys that are my team but they are my family like it's the biggest that's because your father's a good dude my father not your father not your biological father your work father's a good dude you are i thought you were uncle den no no no. i'm talking about your at your other job your police job yeah he's a great he's i'm very very and that's lucky. why everybody starts to behave appropriately you got a good dad you got good kids yeah he's a great chief i'm, I'm very very impressed with him and i'm not just saying and i and now i don't really have to say it right like there's proof like if, yeah it, it is and i just a huge shout out to my guys because they just, they, they wrap me in love all the time. They're just such good men. And I mean, my Sergeant right now, Derek, I just, I've seen him grow up as a cop and to watch him transition and see what a phenomenal leader he is, even at the formal level, not just the informal level he had. And just the, you talk about one bad person and it used to be in law enforcement where it was so much easier to go negative. Ah, we're out of a contract. Fuck these guys. We're not going to do this. Like, they want this, they want this. And our team, while we're frustrated with certain things happening politically or contract wise, they show up for each other. 
And nobody gives the new guys a hard time when they want to go out and get it. And it motivates other people to be better. And we don't have that one bad person anymore at all at our agency. It's, it's unbelievable. So again, I'm, am I scared to transition 100% because I know I'm going to walk into somewhere that needs a little bit of a culture you change. You don't know anybody. I know a few people, but not like not I know like this that. team. Yeah, that's right. Not like, like I that. love these men. I mean, I love them. But I mean, you'll love the next crew. Yeah, yeah. Another, another, another wonderful set of relationships that you get to have. The potential there. But you talk about risk versus reward, and you, and you talk about anxiety and being scared. And, you know, my, I even have it tattooed, like, never let fear decide your future. Right? Like, you talk about fear. That that's, there was too many yeses for me to transition. And people ask all the time, like, I want to leave this agency. I want to do this. And I'm like, then why not just do it? Like if it's bad, go find another agency. What are you so afraid of? What are you so afraid of? He's going to title this podcast. What are you so afraid of? I you bet should. You. Frankie, you hear that? That's what you should title it. All right. So a couple of lessons that came out of today. Make yourself the number one priority or no one else will be able to. I don't think people realize the correlation between the best you and making sure the best you exists. Even diet. Right? People don't realize that what you're putting in is what you're getting out. So. When you opt to go eat smash burger instead of eating just salads, which was last night, I was starving before I went to this podcast in, in North Jersey. And I was like, food near me. I, I'm like, I got to eat. I'm not gonna be, I haven't eaten all day. It's, I just don't want to go down that road. And as I was going towards smash burger, which I thought was my only option, I saw just salads and just made a right turn into there. That's the decision I had to make there because I knew that I'd rather put a kale Caesar into my body than a fucking burger and fries. Yeah. I didn't want the kale Caesar more. I just made a decision because I knew how it would make me feel and how it would make me function. Uh, it's the same know. thing with thoughts, right? Thoughts, like, exercises. Your you know, mindset diet is just as important as your nutrition diet. I don't look at... I was, the last thing I was doing was going to foxnews.com. I haven't touched it in two weeks. I won't. And I feel a lot better. And I just am sick of hearing how bad things are when I know how good things are. Yeah perspective the world's not a perfect place no but i would i don't think everything the media wants you to see is really going on in some sense and i think that those who don't deserve to suffer suffer at what makes headline news and that goes from cops and and uh you know obviously right now the trans community is a big conversation uh, i bet there's a lot of trans people who are probably pretty frustrated with the negative light that's being shown on them when they just want to be who they are, Agreed. which is fine. Um, because I don't think that the seven people that are rubbing people the wrong way should represent an entire community. So I just want people to know that like, for me, I have no judgment on anybody. You want to call yourself a shoe? I'll call you Nike Nikes. I don't give a shit. Um, it has, it's not my business how you want to live your life. But I think it is unfair to a lot of, even cops and uh, any kind of group that's grouped into something. So, you know, I think non-judgment's important. And um, you got to make sure you're around people who don't judge people. I don't know if there's a better quality in a human being. I don't know if there's a better quality in a human being than being non-judgmental. And it you, takes work, and I'm still working on it. Yeah. But it takes work. It does take work every day. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta breathe for a second and not be so quick to come to conclusions and try to understand where the other person's coming from or how they feel. Um, we're so quick to judge. So quick. If you can find people that, that aren't judgmental, my grandmother was the most non-judgmental person I ever met in my life, and it took me till I was about thirty-eight to fucking realize that. And so I just, what would, what would, what would she do? How would she see this situation? Did she ever talk bad about people? I remember my grandmother, um, who was Italian. I think she was born in 1927, grew up in Little Italy, and, you know, it's a whole different time. If you even made a joke about race or anybody else's race, there's a woman who was very funny, very lighthearted, one of the kindest human beings ever in your life, she would have a fit. And she did not like racial jokes because she thought everybody was equal. I love that. She thought everybody, she didn't want to hear anything about it. She didn't want to hear any, anything. She hated That's it. tough back then, too. She actually, you know, it's crazy. Uh, for my father's 70th birthday, I had um, actually found a, my grandmother's handwriting on this. She had cataloged all these real to real films. So, for my father's 70th birthday, and fortunately, my father's Alzheimer's, that we could be nostalgic. So, I had these things converted, put onto 
hard drives and DVDs, and then we played in my backyard for with my family to watch all these um these videos. Really very interesting to watch. And you know, they're going, Oh my god, look who that is. We haven't seen you know, it's this 19, you talk about 19 early 1950s, mid 1940s into the early 60s. This is what we're watching, these videos. And my grandmother remembers speaking about one of her friends who was black, a female that she was very good friends with. I had never met the person or seen her. I just heard about how she worked with her. And in these videos, that one was in it. And my grandmother looked like she was with her sister. So that relationship of who that person was to my grandmother reshaped or made her an independent thinker uh, outside of how everybody else thought. And I honestly think people aren't racist. I think they're just uneducated or lack perspective or they are a product of their environment and need to start thinking more independently. Um, and I think people say things and don't mean them a lot. I think at our core, human beings are wonderful. And I think that I think that people need to start thinking independently about how they really feel about things, not just repeating things they hear. Yeah. So you can't blame people for not having perspective. We're not, it's not like we said, hey, this is how you should think. But if you go against it, that's wrong. It's like people are brought up in yeah. a way to nature versus and, nurture. I mean, people hate the police and people will tell you, I was raised to hate the cops. It takes an independent person to break out of that mold and that mindset. So I like to surround myself with people who are independent thinkers and don't just go with the flow because it's a cool thing to do. I've never gone with the flow. I probably should never work for anybody in my life. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, self-care is not selfish. It's selfless. Yeah. Never let fear decide your future. You can't fight fear. You can dance with it, though. Oh, yeah. I right. love that. Yeah. You yeah. can dance with it. Yeah. So and if I you, if you learn it. how to do the dance, then when fear comes along, you know exactly how to woo fear. And dance with it. I love that people are getting to see this side of you, Dennis. Yeah. Yeah. This Thank is, you. You're welcome. This is a culmination of years and years and years of deep thought. And probably only started when I was at 31. Um, deep thought, constant education, and bits self -awareness. and pieces. Yeah, Self-awareness. But bits, bits and pieces of things that I've heard in the past that I think are fantastic. And I probably run some of my thoughts through those filters. Yeah. Anything else? I want to thank you for doing this with me today. Thank you for saying yes. Of course I would say yes. Uh, anything else? I think you can be who you want to be. And I don't think your past has to dictate your future. And I don't think people's perceptions of you are who you are. And I think you need to stop worrying about what people think about what you're doing. And I think earlier you said something like, yeah, a lot of people are throwing things in your face. For the handful of people that are throwing things in my face are the naysayers of the work that we're doing. We tend to forget about the people who are so thankful of the work that we're doing. Absolutely. So I, when our head defaults immediately to this, let's try to stop for a second and go back to the other side of things of why it's worth it to deal with those fuckers Agreed. and how not to let them impact what you're trying to do. Yeah, that's it. I have nothing else. I have to urinate to know mm. <laughs> all right well this is heather Gloglich, my first ever lead on a podcast dennis thank you so much hey guys check out our upcoming training at streetcop.com don't forget we have 50 instructors nationally teaching a variety of topics these are the best classes you're going to experience in your career. We make sure of it. You're going to love it. I guarantee you, you're going to be thankful that you went. Check us out at streetcop.com for all upcoming classes in your area.